say hallelujah, thine the glory. That is you telling God, be praised. We want to praise you. Praise the Lord. Calling out to anybody around, praise him, praise him, keep praising him. He deserves it. We could be here, we could be here all day long, and it still wouldn't be a drop in the bucket for what God deserves. So we're going to try. Sit tight. We're going to sit here the next four hours and try to... You know, you say something like that and people start to panic. I think it was, uh, was it last week where, oh man, now I don't even remember the phrase, Jim. But I said, oh, oh, I know what it was. In my prayer, I said, uh, we're talking about uh, maybe, I don't remember what it was. Yeah, for two, two hours or four hours. And they thought I said two hours or four hours, you know, like the, as this sermon will be going on for the next two hours. Uh, no, no, no. It turned out to be not the case. So uh, don't panic. Don't worry. But praising God, that is why we're here. It is what we're singing about. Uh, it is, you know, to his glory. It is our privilege to his glory. And, and so I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that we could gather together. I'm glad that there are people joining us uh, over the, the uh, web, and we just thank God continually. I know that things are happening. You know, we have camp that, you know, did its best to still come together and, and give something to the kids. I think that was successful. And I think as we go on, uh, you know, we just keep looking for those opportunities. Those are all ways of turning back to God and praising Him as well. So I'm thankful for all that's been going on and all that continues to go on. We have our bonfire this Wednesday night, and it turns out that's the first one I'm able to attend. So I'm excited about that. Uh, I wonder how it's going to go, but we're all invited. We're going to be outside. We're going to be around. Uh, maybe not a bonfire, but it will be a it would be, you know, something being consumed by fire, so uh, come and be a part of that. Before we begin our lesson, let's go to the Father in prayer. Lord, you truly are, God, worthy of our praise, worthy of something that comes from the deepest parts of our hearts to express to you how much we love you, how much we appreciate what you've done for us. And we pray that we can learn today about how to do that better, how to uh, be able to express uh, what is truly on our hearts, no matter what comes our way. We thank you, and we praise you, and we ask your blessing on the rest of our worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We have been going through examples of kings and queens in the Old Testament, uh, and it is really for our benefit to look at their lives, look at these moments in their lives, and say, what can we learn about how to be leaders. You know, you, almost everyone in this room is either a leader now or has been a leader or will be a leader. I mean, we, we're given that, sometimes we don't even ask for it, but we're given the mantle of leadership so often. And so the Bible doesn't hold back. It gives us examples and they're not always good. Uh, we looked at, uh, you know, some good ones and we looked at a bad one or two. And today it's another good one uh, for the most part. Uh, there's two people involved, uh, especially toward the end. One, you know, it's a good example and a bad example. It's a mixed thing because the Bible is real life. It's not going to say, oh, everybody, everything was fine. Nobody ever disagreed. Nobody ever had trouble. No, it just gives it as it is, and we're to learn from it then. So the event that we want to look at today is when David brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant, as you know, was this box, this thing that was carried around. It was built during the Exodus, and it became truly the symbol. This was the, the, the place where you know, God would dwell in the tabernacle. And it had been moving from place to place. Uh, it was in the hands of the Philistines for a while. That didn't go well for the Philistines. They, did, they, they sent it back. We don't want that thing uh, because it is that special. It's that amazing. And as we look now at this story, David is going to be bringing it into the city of Jerusalem, his capital. And we want to look at first the public celebration, which is the, as many people as could gather for this celebration did gather in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. And then it's going to move to a private conversation between a husband and a wife, between a king and a queen, actually. And we're going to look at this whole story and try to learn from it, try to gain from it. Now, here's the thing. In sermons, one of the things they tell you never to do is to have two points. Because what happens is the person hearing it will, you know, if you have three points, you can remember it. 
two points for some reason, you just, you kind of just drop it. And so it's not going to be a two-point sermon. It's going to be like a six or seven-point sermon just to try to avoid that idea. But it's, it's a story in two parts which could not be avoided. All right, so work with me. Try to remember some of the things that uh, we're looking at here. So we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6, starting in verse 12. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Now this is a good moment. This is an amazing moment. David knows the significance of the ark of the covenant. This is the, the symbol of the covenant between the people and their God, between the Israelites and Yahweh, who had blessed them so much, and now we're bringing it to the place where we've made the center of this kingdom that now David is in charge of. And he knows that the fact that they're moving it safely, which is a difference from what they started with, uh, that's a story we're not going to get into, but at the beginning, they tried to move it on a brand new cart, their own kind of way, and that did not go well. But now they're moving it the right way, and David says, this is great. This is great. We're doing the right things, and God is already showing his favor. And so David cannot help himself. I don't know what David's plan was for this day, how he was going to place himself in the procession as it goes into Jerusalem. But I have a feeling that as it went on, he became so full of joy that he couldn't help but begin to move, right? I mean, I picture children. It's a shame that there are so few children now at weddings. But did you ever see children at weddings when it's time to celebrate? You know, children tend to just, they don't have to be told, go dance for a while. I have to be told that. My wife has to grab me physically and say, come on, we need to dance for a little while. All right, okay, all right. Children, children jump right into it. You play some music, off they go. I feel like that's what's happening with David here. He can't help himself. He just begins to sing. He begins to shout. And so they're moving into the city. Oh, okay. So, verse 16. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So we have a little bit more to go with the public celebration, but you're getting a little bit of a hint as to what that private conversation is going to be about between David and his wife, who is the daughter of Saul. And they had a, a, an interesting relationship. You know, they, she was promised to David. Then Saul took her away when David lost favor with Saul. Uh, then David had to win her back, and he got her back. And she's his wife, and she's looking down. She's not part of this celebration. She's not part of this procession. She's looking down from a window, and she sees David doing his dancing, doing his moves, and she despises him in her heart. More on that in a moment. Story continues. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. Now this public celebration, this is a good day, right? I mean, David's going to have some bad days down the road, right? But this is not one. This is a good day. It might be one of David's best days. I mean, you might say, you know, that his facing off with Goliath was a high point, no doubt about it. But when it comes to him being king and what a king should be doing, boy, this was a good day. Here he was unabashedly worshiping God, going before him, bringing the ark into the city. Here in this moment, if we're going to pick up some leadership lessons, here in this moment, David makes it clear, this is a time to celebrate. Ecclesiastes tells us there are times for everything, right? For everything, there's a season. 
and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to weep, yes, certainly, but also a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. And David says, the ark coming into this city, we've got to dance. I can see him getting jittery, like, oh, this is so great. This is so wonderful. Uh, and, and he just begins to dance. David says, it is time to celebrate. Leaders need to know when it's time to celebrate because there are times for it. And people look to leaders to know, is this the right time? Is this the time for me to let loose with some celebration, with some joy? So often we are subdued. We are, well, what are the words for it, right? We, we are almost stoic in our approach. Even when you walk into these doors, we've already talked today about how amazing it is to worship God and how amazing God is, how worthy of worship he is. But what do we do? We design the worship service to sit and go, oh, yes, that was very good. That was very good. <laughs> we all do it. I'm not saying you do it and I don't. We all, we all do that. We're very subdued. You know what Paul calls the worship assembly in Corinthians? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The context there is the assembled group of Christians, the church coming together. Paul says, you know, in Corinth, you've got trouble, you've got problems, you tolerate too much evil. Look, when you come together to celebrate the festival, I want you to be able to do it in sincerity and truth. But don't miss the fact that he says to celebrate. Don't miss that. Because we, of course, don't want to be sitting here tolerating sin, but we also don't want to miss the fact that this is a celebration. It's okay to smile every once in a while. And some of you are saying, I've been smiling, Mike. You can't see my face. You can't see it. I, I'm, I'm the masked you know, smiler over here. And that may be true, and God knows our hearts. But it is a time to celebrate. There is a time for that, and David makes it clear. Now is the time here in Jerusalem. Look at this quote and see if this isn't us sometimes. There are doubtless times to be calm and times to be enthusiastic, but can it be right to give all our coldness to Christ and all our enthusiasm to the world? Oof, that hits hard, right? Because we come to worship and we figure we better be self-controlled, we better be, you know, almost stone-like, but... When we go out in the world, there are things that we jump up and down for. There's things we cheer for. There's things we raise our voices for. Is that right? This guy's saying to give our coldness to Christ always. I hope, even if it's not here in this worship time, I hope there are times when you kind of let loose with God. Maybe privately, you know, maybe to yourself because you don't, you know, want to make a spectacle. But do you sometimes just let loose and praise God? Maybe in your car, as there's a, a song comes on, on K-Love or something like that, and oh, I love this song, I love this, and you think about what it means, and you begin to worship God, I hope that you do. I think we all need times like that. Earl talks about his, his prayer shack, where he goes and he prays to God. I wish I could be there to see if Earl does any dancing. It may be that he's out there dancing, we just don't know, we don't see it, he keeps it to himself. But there's a public celebration. David makes it clear. It's time to celebrate. But David doesn't just dance, and he doesn't just shout. It's not just words. David does more here. Do you notice this? David blesses the people, and he blesses them in the name of the Lord, and then he also gives them food. He, he doesn't just say, oh, let's have a feast. He says, we're going to have a feast. Here's the food. That's the best kind of feast to go to, by the way, when they don't expect you to bring the food or to go home and provide your own food. David says, I'm going to give it to you. This is a major contrast to what Israel has been told will happen when they have a king. Maybe you don't remember this, but when the people first ask for a king, they say to Samuel, go appoint us a king. We want a king. We're tired of being the only nation around here without a king. Samuel says, okay, but you have to understand some things. When you get a king, he's going to do some taking. He literally says all of these things. He will take your sons and make them charioteers. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers, bakers, whatnot. He'll take your servants. He'll take a tenth of your flocks. He'll take the best of your fields, vineyards, orchards. He's going to be a taker. 
because that's what kings do. They take so that then they can use it for the nation's good, hopefully, right? But Samuel says that's what happens with a king. But here, King David, as he's bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant in, instead of being a taker, becomes a giver, becomes somebody who begins to hand out food. This is a good day for David. This is the right thing. This is what a king should be doing, not simply saying words, but also serving. It's the way Paul described his own ministry. Uh, this is First Thessalonians. We, in order we seek glory from people as a king might, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, words, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Do you think there was any Israelite going home with, you know, arms full of food, thinking that the king doesn't care about the people? David made some friends that day. David made connections that day. He said, I, I want to be this kind of king for you. I'm not always going to get it right. And we know he doesn't always get it right. There's some examples that will come. But the people were dear to him. He was that kind of leader. And that, Paul says, that's what we have always tried to do. But of course, this story continues. This, the next phase, phase two, beginning in verse 20. And David returned to bless his household. Can we just stop there for a moment? Just read that first sentence again with me. And David returned to bless his household. He blesses the nation in both word and in service. And then he turns to his own household, ready to also bless them in the name of the Lord. That's the context for this private conversation that happens. That adds to the tragedy of what's about to unfold. David returned to bless his household, but Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. In Michal's eyes, what she saw David doing had nothing to do with worship or celebration. She saw a man who was simply caught up in vulgarity, was simply caught up in being shameless. And she saw not just servants out there watching their king, but servants of servants, she says. The lowest of the low out there were seeing you make a fool of yourself. What does that say about this queen's mindset? Here we are up in our tower, and I look down, and I see the little people, and you're among the little people. This makes no sense. This is shameless. And not only that, you're dancing around in this linen ephod in your underwear, practically, right? How dare you? She does not get it. David answers. David, David said to me, call. It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel. The people of the Lord and I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. It's a shame, it, you know, in that those three times where Michal is described, she's not described as David's wife. She's not described as Israel's queen. She's described as Saul's daughter, the, the failed king, the one who David replaced. That's how she's described. She's a Saul person. She's, she's, a, she's Saulish, whereas we've moved on from Saulishness. We've moved on to David's brand of worship and David's brand of kingship. So in this private conversation, are there things that we can pick up on? You better believe it. David listens Husbands, listen to me now. You listen to me. David listens. He hears his wife. Now, he doesn't agree with her. He responds, of course, with facts and truth. He doesn't respond angrily, as I might have.
But the first point is he listens. How do we know he listens to his wife? I'll show you exactly how. This is what she has to say. Oh, look how the king honored himself out there. Sarcasm. She's using sarcasm. Among the female servants, you were just out there shamelessly. But here's David's response. The first thing's first. It was before the Lord. You, you, you missed that. You both didn't see it and, it, and you didn't mention the fact that this was all before the Lord. It's almost as if, and I, I can't get into David's heart and mind, but it's almost as if that entire procession, he was only before the Lord, surrounded by thousands, but it was between him and God. It was before the Lord, the one who chose me over your father Saul. Let's remember that. It was before him that I celebrated, and I will continue to do this kind of thing. I will continue to celebrate before the Lord, and I will look contemptible or shameless to you, but in front of the female servants, I really will be honored, not sarcastically. You see that? He heard her, answered her point by point, the center point being, look, I'm before the Lord, and the Lord made me king. You have forgotten this. You, you, you're thinking in terms of how kings ought to be, how dignified kings ought to be. You're missing it. You're missing the fact that it's all about before the Lord, offering him my worship, and I will be honored. So David listens, and he responds. He sticks to facts. He sticks to truth, and I recommend this in all private conversations, but also husbands, Listen, listen, we need to be better at listening. That's a whole other sermon, right? We can do better. But the second thing is here, look, you can do all of the right things and still be despised. That is a hard truth. That was hard for me to type, okay? But it's so true. That is what's abundantly true in this story. David, with his heart, which seemed pure, he wants to do the right thing. He knows this is good for the people. And he's out there, and the person who should be right at his side is distant, critical, and despising. This happens to leaders all the time. It happens all the time. In fact, the more you do the right thing, the more likely it is that you'll be despised. That's just the truth of leadership. When you put your neck out, when you step out, it's likely that Satan is going to do the the prodding and the pushing to push somebody to put you in the category of somebody they they can't stand. Look at Jesus. Happened over and over again with him. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. I love that little again, right? They picked up stones again. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Wonderful answer. You know, you're, you're about to throw stones at me. Let, let's talk about the wonderful things that I've done. Which of those wonderful things are, am I going to get stoned here for? The, the good things that I've been doing among you? And they answer, not for that reason, uh, for other reasons. You know, you're blasphemy for one, right? They don't, they don't get a chance to kill him at that moment. Spoiler alert. Again, Peter, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. This is when Peter and John are arrested after helping the crippled beggar. Filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing well before you, before you well. And so Peter is right in line. He's saying, we've been arrested, we've been held overnight in jail, For doing what exactly? For doing a good thing. For healing this man in Jesus' name. Okay, so now that you're calling us in front of you, we'll we'll just say it again. Jesus' name, that's what happened here. It's this Jesus that you crucified. He is working through us. And so Peter just uses it as an opportunity. But they are being despised. They can't stand them. It literally says they are annoyed by the apostles. That's what can happen. That's what happens sometimes, often, when we step out in leadership to do the right thing. But there's an answer to that. Keep this in mind, and David shows it. Godly leaders know the source of their strength. Godly leaders know that I, if I stay the course, if I stay right with him, then the criticisms I receive can bounce off. They won't stick. 
They won't tear me down. They won't be anchors on my soul that keep me from feeling the joy inside. No, no, no. I'm going to cut that loose because I'm right with him and I'm in line with him. Godly leaders know where the source of strength comes from. Paul, when he's at maybe his most bleak moment, he, he talks about it in 2 Timothy. At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. That's what's happening with his trial. Think about all the people that Paul has spoken to, friends he has made, fellow workers that he has you know, worked with side by side, the, the thousands of people he probably preached to. But when he needed them, when he was you know, in front of you know, judges, when he was you know, battling for his life, everyone deserted him. There was no one there. All deserted me. May it not be charged against them. Godly leaders can say that. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul was a man who drew criticism like a magnet draws certain metals, right? He drew it. He, he was a lightning rod for it. And yet he said, I will be strengthened. God strengthened me then, and I know he's going to rescue me if that's his plan. And then he's ultimately going to bring me together with him eternally. So what does all this matter? It doesn't matter. I'm strengthened by the one who can truly give me inner strength. There was a great song written by Twyla Paris, and you may not have heard it since the 80s, some of you who are around in the 1980s, maybe 90s, but uh, this is how it goes. It says, lately I've been winning battles left and right, but even winners can get wounded in the fight. People say that I'm amazing, strong beyond my years, but they don't see inside of me. I'm hiding all the tears. They don't know that I go running home when I fall down. They don't know who picks me up when no one is around. I drop my sword and look up for a smile because deep inside this armor, the warrior is a child. And that's what godly leaders have to fall back on. I'm out there, I'm taking shots to the chest. The armor is rattling, but I can still look up to my father. And he can turn and say, well done. Keep it up. Push through. Keep doing the right things for my sake. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what the queen says in her ivory tower. It doesn't matter. Press on. Remain faithful. That is what we gain from this story. A wonderful day, an amazing day for David that ends on such a sour note, like happens so often in family life, right? And certainly in leadership, where we're out there and we think things are going just the right way, and then there's cold water thrown all over it. But God says, at those moments, I'm going to be there for you. Will you live a life that is in line with me so that I can keep strengthening you? so that you can walk unfazed through those fires. That's the kind of life God calls you to today. Maybe you need to respond to him for the first time in your life. Maybe you need to become a follower of his that can remain unfazed, untarnished throughout all of the difficulties of life. He offers that to you today. Come as we stand and sing.